Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Tachlis. Wow, we just came out of an amazing interview with a very special man who he and his entire family are really working hard and assembling and giving all of the koiches to help and build one of the children who is never struggling and they really buckled up to do what's right even though it was not easy and not so popular in the beginning but they really struggled through and Baruch Hashem today they have a lot of a lot of advancements to share this was not an easy interview and all of you like to see interviews chick chak and watch it for 20 seconds and know the whole story this is not the case it was not an easy interview took a little time to unravel and come to the point but wait and see what you're about to hear you're going to be really surprised and mesmerized and really feel admiration for this family for what they did so take your time watch the entire podcast wait till the end there's a few good stories in the end and you'll really like what you're seeing enjoy <laughs> Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Tachlis. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. You share your time with us. We know your time is valuable, special, especially before Pesach. And we really appreciate it. Today we have a very special guest, like I always tell you, in Let's Talk Tachlis. Sometimes it takes us a little too long till we do the next podcast, but we are very, very picky. And when we bring on a guest, it has to be super special. So today, without further ado, let me introduce to you Rabbi Mr. Isaac Miller. Hello, Mr. Miller. Thank you for introducing me as a very, very special person. I really appreciate it. The people who watch so far, they don't know you're special. But by the end of this interview, they'll all know you're special. So I'm jumping ahead of the game and we'll go straight to the chase. Um, Mr. Miller, Isaac, my, my dear guest, has a unique and very powerful story to share with the world. The story is not such a pleasant story. Um, he's doing a very tremendous job. He and his entire family, really as a group, are working very, very hard to make the story very pleasant. And he has a lot of successes on his column, Baruch Hashem. Um, he's going to be very brave, I hope, and I believe tonight to share a personal painful story with tens of thousands of viewers. And uh, the only reason he was willing to come here and share with you the story is because he feels that there's a lot for all of us to learn and know in this subject. And he really has a mission to make the world a better place and make Klaalis soul and Klaalis Eklalesos children happier and healthier, and that's why he's here tonight. So, what's going on, Mr. Miller? Without further ado, I would like to thank you for the opportunity for sharing my story. I wouldn't call it pain, I would call it maybe painly, not painful, because there's a lot of joy as well when you see what you can accomplish and what you can do and how you can turn things around. There's really a lot of joy and a lot to be happy about. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I'm happy, I'm a happy person. And I'm trying to put a smile on other people's faces as well. I <clears throat> share my story a lot and I go out and I talk to people. And Baruch Hashem, many, many people thank me today for their smile on their face. I think Shem, making people smile is in your DNA, right? Yes. Fortunately. Yes. I, know, I don't know if any one of you heard the name Miller ever. Nah. Is it the same Miller? I always say I'm from the Rabun Hashem Miller. Yes. So Isaac's father is the very special Yarmaru Rabbi Uncle Miller, a very famous Mesamaya Halakim, the Udon person. So for them to put smiles on people's faces is an everyday occurrence. But today, let's see how we can put a smile, how we can gift wrap this story. 
So let me hear what happened in short. So I, I asked some of inter my interviewees, why are you here today? Can you answer that? Sure. I don't think that uh, it's a hard question at all. When I share a little bit of my story, I first always make a disclaimer. I'm sharing a story. I'm not here as a professional, and I don't want anyone to view me as one. I'm not giving the advice, and I'm not telling anyone what to do. I'm just saying what happened to me and my family, and how we, I believe, very successfully got to where we are, and our hopes are high that we, we know that we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, and we're going to get to the end of the tunnel. We'll get, out, we'll get outside. It's, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame. So <clears throat> I can say, uh, like every typical person, I grew up in Vizhnet, in Mansi. I was born, raised over there. I grew up as a Vizhnet Sahusit. I got married over there, I lived over there, I raised my children there, I started marrying off my kids while I lived over there. My whole life was in that circle, in that bubble, a vision to Hasidus. And in our days, we live and we see many kids who struggle. And it is only normal to try to be judgmental and in most cases, we judge the parents. We look at the family as a failing family, even if it's only one child of 10 or one child of more. We still look at somehow they failed. We try to find the reason. And the easiest reason, the easiest person to target is always the family. So as all of us, I was the same. I was a typical person. I know exactly why every kid is struggling and how the parents are to blame. One parent was too strict, the other one was too soft. There was one was easy going, one was hard going. But uh, you know, there was always, and I knew exactly why it happened. Everything was lined up, all Every, the excuses. Yes, not the excuses, the reasons. The reasons. The reasons. Yeah. And it all went well, till it happened to me. And in the beginning, I would say, uh, I would admit, I was judgmental on myself too. Where did I go wrong? And I was focused on that. Where did I go wrong? What did I do bad? Why did it happen to me? It must be my fault. I didn't know if I should blame myself or my wife, maybe. So automatically, things started getting very tense at home. I always I started feeling insecure in everything I did, because maybe I'm going too hard, too soft. I should, I should not, but all the rest of the kids. I lost my confidence, and the same thing, I didn't know for sure if it's maybe my wife's fault and I should blame her, and we, we did, we, it, it started, the, the ripple effect of this was huge, it was unbearable, and it had a very, very bad impact on the whole house, automatically, and I, whoever I talk to, it's only normal, people it happens to, it had an effect on the house. And one of the things that I started feeling was, I started feeling guilty for everybody. So first I felt guilty, of course, for my own kids. Then I felt guilty for my neighbors, that their kids are going to have such a kid in their neighborhood. And I felt guilty for the family, they're going to have to live in shame, and they're going to be embarrassed. My parents, my wife's parents, my own brothers and sisters and siblings, my wife's. Uh, I didn't know where this is taking me. So I was like lost, I was in the dark and nervous. I didn't sleep for nights, I was worried. And, not, and on top of that, I was also worried about my own child, my kid that's struggling when it all started to unravel. It was a very bad situation, tough situation. When I realized what's going on, the only thing I saw was that she disappeared night after night. I had no clue where she is. I would, uh, I would not go out of my house at night and walk anywhere. Night, late, late at night, I'm that type of a person who stays home. I wouldn't walk around and wander on streets. And when I found out later where she was at the other end of town, without being scared, she was a young girl. 
And How old she was she when it really started bursting out? I think 14, wow, 15. really young. Yeah. So I realized there's two things that are going on. She got herself some pants, uh, found it under her pillow, and I started looking after her. So my focus was, I was so, I can say, focused on the wrong thing altogether. I was focusing on how to put boundaries and what can I do to get her back on track and how I can make it happen and how control. quick, not only control, but how quick I can do it. I knew that the trick is the quicker I do it, the less shame I'll have, the less, before it goes on the street. I didn't want the street to know. Little did I know that before I even knew, Everyone they saw that. it, they saw it. Many people that I meet today, they're busy you know, about the neighbors and about the neighborhood. They shouldn't find out. They all know. Before you know it, they know it. And I was trying to protect my, my, my dignity, my family, my reputation. I felt everything is on the line. So really, it's a very, it's a very difficult balance to, to game to play. Because on one hand, you do have feelings for your own kids, for the other kids. And you, want, you do want to protect your kids. They are your kids. You don't know what's good for them. You don't know what's not good for them. And you have your wife, you have yourself. Let's not talk a little ex the extended family, but your own, your own immediate family that sit with you every day by the, sub, by the dinner table and Shabbos dish, um, you feel very bad for them, right? And you also separately st are starting to learn that you're feeling bad for your daughter also. So how do you really juggle between these two these two feelings. It's, it's, uh, it's not a simple task that you get a, a book, a manual, how to deal with it. First of all, I realized that by being this nervous and by being worried so much and by trying to control the situation, I'm only harming all, my entire family. I was a calm person, a, a normal person, and suddenly I became that nervous father without any patience to anyone, skeptical, and with no confidence, and I didn't know what to answer. I was always, my mind was flying around and worries and worrying, and I couldn't uh, concentrate when the kids were talking to me. I realized that in an effort to try to control the situation, I'm losing the situation. So it's not a matter, people think that you can control the situation by, in any ways or means, there is no such a thing. You have to let it go a little, like what's, how so, can you okay, so it brought me stop to, yourself from wanting to control? Right. So when I realized that, con I always say today, when I look back and people tell me, you're enabling, right? This is a very popular word, became the word enabling. And I always say, you can use, what is the opposite word of enabling? Disable. Disabling. Can you disable? No. You don't control the situation anyways. So it's not called enabling when you, don't, when you can't disable. When you can control it, when you realize that it's anyways not in your, your control and it's not in your hands, you, you don't do anything different to let, when, you, when you let go, it's not even called let go. That's when you take, instead of trying to take the situation and control the situation, you control yourself. That's all it, it is, self-control and stay focused on what you're trying to accomplish. Where are you heading? What do you want to do? Where do you want to get? So I want to roll it back a little bit because um, unfortunately it became very rampant and unfortunately we see it in so many families. Um, is there like a certain time or incident or situation that you were able to, you, you can pinpoint today and say, this caused it, these are the signals that you have to watch from, like when, when Looking back now, I, I want to hear soon about your, your relationship with your daughter these days and those days, but how's the shulam? What should parents look, look out for when they the shulam, are facing similar situations starting to unravel? In general, once you see that what your kid is doing things, not the way all the rest of the family does it, and not the way you raise them, and it doesn't make any sense what they're doing, that's when you realize that your kid, you should realize that your kid must be in a bad place, I would call it. 
when I say a bad place, it means that they are broken for whatever reason, one or the other, and it's irrelevant. But once they're broken, I always say, it had nothing to do with Yiddishkeit, Goyishkeit. It has to do with the person, that there's a person over there. And a broken person is not a person. When you're dealing with a kid that is broken, then don't, they can't control. They, they, they cannot do anything. They're broken. unable. They're broken. It's broken. Like a broken car cannot be on the road. It's broken. And once you realize that, you come to realization with uh, fact, with the situation, and you live with that situation, you realize that the only thing you can control is yourself. You were saying that if you see unconventional moves and all kind of... Uh... If things don't make sense, then uh, you, realize, you should realize, I, I realized that it's not in her control and it's not something that she does intentionally. Now, it's in my own hands if I should uh, m make it more complicated for her and for me, or make it easier for her and for me, and it's going to make like, life much simpler. What I mean by that is a few things. Number one, I'll do whatever it takes to remove spite. If spite is in play, then it just becomes worse, it unravels. Right? Just to spite me. Dafka. Yeah, for Dafka. So what I had, for instance, now I have very open conversations with my daughter. And she recently repeated to me, and she said that in the beginning of her journey, she started, uh, she always used to speak in, to me in Yiddish, to my wife in English. As girls do, it's very common. And I was okay with that. But when st things started to unravel, I moved back and I was trying to take the situation uh, and make it even stricter. And a stricter rule, I'm going to bend it the other way. This is how I'm going to take control. So I said, from now on, on you cannot even talk to mommy in English anymore. And what do you think happened? She started talking to me in English. And she wouldn't talk to me anymore in Yiddish. Wow. Nothing would make her talk to me in Yiddish. And recently she repeated to me that story. She remembered that. Wow. So you can see what spite does, right? Wow. She, could, she was not ready to take orders. She couldn't, she couldn't tolerate any structure or anything. This is what well, they can't. When they're broken, they cannot. So you can do whatever you want. You can kill them. And they won't, it won't change. So there's a few things that you must remove, that I felt I must remove. And I'm, again, I go back, I'm not saying you. I'm saying me. Uh, what uh, I but think. I'm sure it took a long time for you to become who you are today, from taking, going away from all the spites and becoming... And all it took was, and my main thing was, not to lose focus. And it is still today. So now it's easy. It goes automatically. My focus is like this. And it automatically, any situation that comes up by instinct, it's about her and not about me. It, and, and I can tell you this much, that it made me a better father to all my kids. My older kids always tell me that they wish I was this kind of a father <laughs> when they grew up. Wow. Because to all my younger kids, and, and it's not only, if you take this kid and by her you make her an exception, it's going to make the other kids jealous and it could affect them. No. Change yourself. And I change a myself. Us. A new us. And it's a new me. And it's all about my kids. So whatever she needs, I'm for that. And whatever another kid needs, even in a normal situation, in the way I was before, I wouldn't give in so easily to stuff. I am make, trying all I can to make sure they feel that my, the, I'm devoted to them and I want to make their life as good as I can. And we're not talking about... Spoiling, going no, crazy. No, we're not talking about that at all. I'm talking about taking them to a, a Sfurim store and spending time with them. They're even in a Sfurim store. I let them roam around and buy books. It costs a lot of money. But books they enjoy. I'm talking comic books. And for one kid that likes Hasidic Shifurim, I would spend money on that. Games, toys. I would they are number one. Them. The kids, they are number one. They are number one for me in yes. life. And it changed a lot. Wow. And <clears throat> the other thing that I did was, that I realized, is Chazal tell us, Oy chavrisa, oy If a person doesn't have a friend, they rather die. So I realized that a lot of Kids, I, I, I'll go back a little bit to humor. I always say that 
People are scared about the other kids. They start to worry. And why is that? You have to understand them, though. People who don't have the experience, this is really the biggest scare. I know. So, but I, and I'm not judgmental today to anyone, right? Even to people that judge me, I'm not judgmental to them because I know that I was that person before. I was the normal person. I'm no longer normal, and I don't expect anyone to look at me as normal, and I'm fine with that. So I don't mind if people judge me at all. And so one of the things is I always say that why is it when the first kid struggles, the parents are blamed? This is normal. We blame the parents. If a second kid struggles, no one would think that the same thing that caused the first kid to struggle, maybe it was some kind of a molester or it was someone else in any other way of abuse that did the same thing to the second child. No. But the second child, they will blame the first child. So what happened? So people will say, right, you kept him in the house, and this kid brought down the next kid. And I always turn to them and I say, so you can explain to me why it happened to the first kid. The first kid didn't have a sibling before, and it still happened. I was going to ask you if there is a, if there is a certain explanation, any explanation, why it happens to one particular kid versus other kids in the family. The same thing goes in, in physical health. If uh, they have two brothers, same family, grew up together, and both smoke, one of them gets cancer, dies, and the other brother or sister smokes heavy, same, and lives to the 90. What does it tell you? So it doesn't tell you that smoking is healthy, definitely not. But it tells you that one person can be built better, better or better genes or something that made him be able to tolerate the smoke, right? And the same thing goes over here. It could be two people can be as equally abused or bullied or whatever it takes to cause trauma. One person can tolerate better trauma than another. So there's no general, like you always compare it to health situations, right? Every doctor, any sickness, any organ, cardiologist, no people, no, no doctor would treat two patients alike. Every person, according to his abilities, according to his strengths, according to his weaknesses. The same goes with kids. The same thing goes with, comes with spirituality. One person can take abuse and go on with life, and another person cannot. May I ask you a question? But you can tell me to back off. You think you, by now, know maybe what triggered this particular kid to be different than her siblings, a particular event or a happening that happened to her? Very sadly, I have a fe uh, not a f only a feeling, I have more than a feeling. She, when we became close and she became close and open and wasn't scared to talk, she basically did express to my wife what, what caused it. I'm sure. It's unpleasant, and I don't think that here is the place no, 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 to I, talk. I, I don't want to go into very painful details. I'm, I'm shaken as is anyway. But I can tell you one thing. At a certain point, when she was open with us, and we had started having, op having open conversations, even today, it's not a problem. We can have any kind of, situ of conversation, it's not a problem, nothing is sensitive. And she, to she revealed to my wife that when she was... 12 years old, she couldn't sleep through the night. She had problems staying asleep. She had nightmares from what happened to her, and she couldn't sleep through the night. But she wanted to, she was trying, she was struggling to be able to go to school. So you know what she did? She was 12 years old. She used to go downstairs, and I had some place where I had kept my like whiskey of the night. and vodka. She would go down, get drunken up. Wow. Night after night, and she fell asleep with vodka or, this is very painful, vodka, or whiskey, a young innocent child. And it shouldn't be that way. So when, when, now when I look back, and I feel only sorry for her that this is how, what she went through. This is so painful. This is what it took her to fall asleep. I can blame anything. I can blame her on anything. I feel only good of what I, what I did, the way I turned it out, the way I realized it. I should my and it was just mamas. When he daven every day, ask for it, cycle, it's the wichtigste Sache. Realize, open your eyes, it might not be pleasant to look, your, to look at your problem, to, to face, face your problem, face, yeah, like and to deal with it. It's not always pleasant, but you have to do it. This is our struggle in life.
to face your problems and deal with it accordingly. Now, there's a, if you can stay focused on what, where you're trying to get and what you're looking to accomplish and don't look at any side uh, matters, you can be very successful. And when I say side matters, I mean even myself, my own ego, my own dignity. I have to let go of that. And it involves very much. And if you think deeply into a lot of things that people do, it's about saving their faith, their own faith, their to own dignity. World, into this world, for sure. And it's normal. It's a normal instinct of a person. It became worse in the past 20, 30 years. People today do many things for themselves. They don't take in consideration the, the, the true meaning and the true good of the person they are representing, supposedly, because it's such a world today. It's a huge avoid, I'm sure, to to no, disconnect yourself. You go to Shiel, you go to, you go to work, you meet your siblings, you meet your family, you meet everybody, and, and everybody's pointing, rolling their eyes. Even if, she's, if the kid is not there, or the kid is there, especially when the kid is there. But I'm sure it's, 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 it's till you became a routine to disconnect the feelings from all the outside cameras and photographers and, and uh, analyzers. I'm sure it was a very, very big struggle. It's probably one of the hardest struggles in, in the game, in this, in this saga. In the beginning, yeah, in the beginning, I was like in a cave, in my own world. I wasn't sharing anything with anyone. And until I was approached by neighbors, who probably meant well. Yeah. Um, but what were they looking for? The joke, the cemetery is, is uh, paved with the roads of many people who meant well. Sadly, but... I can I see I'm not judgmental against them as well because what they believed and they scared they say that they are scared for their own kids that they're going to bring down the neighborhood and it's going to ruin their kids I'm not so sure that this is really what they're scared but it's an instinct people think oh this is going to represent our neighborhood this is how the neighborhood is going to start a look I don't want this in my neighborhood and people get all excited by it and I don't blame them. It happens to me that some people <clears throat> think the opposite. They said, oh, now my kids can see what, what they, should, they should not look like. If a girl's house is wearing pants, or a boy is wearing a, like, not wearing a couple, or this and that. So some people tell the, chick, the, the kids, you see him or her, don't be like him or her. I can tell you one thing that in the beginning, when my daughter dropped out of school, Someone asked my younger daughter, who was only nine at that uh, well, time. I'm, I'm afraid to hear. And it's very simple. He asked a simple question. Are you jealous at your sister? That she doesn't have to go to school wow. and she gets away with anything. So are you jealous at her? And she answered no. And when the person, I didn't tell her anything. And when the person asked her why, and you know how well she, answered, she answered? And this is what kids realize on their own. You don't have to explain anything. She said, because my sister is not happy. Wow. A nine-year-old. A nine-year-old. And she said, I wow. see, she's not happy. Wow. So it doesn't make anyone kids. jealous. No one wants to follow. No one looks to follow wow. that. There's no such a thing that one... Uh, I, I can only say one thing. If this kid, if you try to control the situation, what, happen, what ends up happening is that this kid feels isolated. And because they can't follow rules, they can't follow anything. So every day it's about them and they're targeted and there's fights and they go back and forth and tension around them. They feel, they start feeling isolated. Now, if a kid, once a kid feels isolated, as I said before, oi chavrisa, oi metzisa, the kid need, the kid needs someone on their side. So what is the, what is the kid like, like this going to do? Trying to pull one other kid of the family to be with them. Someone should understand me. Someone should be my friend. It's someone not should be, be my, my parents, side. For sure it's not, not going to be my parents. It's not the whole family. Let me at least get someone on my side. And this is when probably some people might pull uh, other kids together, together with them. But if you stop that and, you, and it's about them and you focus on that, and there is no spite. This is the first thing that flies out the window. There is no <clears throat> dirty talking, no cursing. No screaming, no, no yelling. No screaming, no yelling. There's calmness in the house. Automatically, it brings a new atmosphere, a new... Mm -hmm. and, they, and, and there's no thing my side, her side. So she has no need to pull someone 
and she's equally as everyone as is. One small announcement. Many of you had the issue that you could not watch the podcast on a filtered phone. And I really admire the people who took upon them, take upon themselves to have a kosher phone and stick to it. So we just made big upgrades to our website, let's talk and you're going to be able to watch directly the interviews without going through YouTube. Enjoy and let's continue. First stage, a person has a shul and starts to realize where does he go? Das Teure. How does he bechlal know how to start going to professionals? I know you have you had you have a rebbe and you had a rebbe in your life, and and <clears throat> not it's not an easy situation for any rebbe to control today. Unfortunately, it's becoming more and more um, common. Unfortunately, but like. What do you do? Like, boom, a ton of bricks fell on my head. What do you do? So, one thing that we must realize is when you look in Arba Chalka Shulchanurich, you don't find any halucha for such a situation. So, really go back and say the word Das Teure. I don't think there is anywhere in the halucha something to refer to. Yeah, but Das Teure, we believe, is a special seat of the Shema, yeah? Maybe you had a story with one, maybe you went to one of your rabbis or one of your people that, that had a certain opinion about this situation of how, how you should handle it and, and was it successful, was it not, like I'm sure, I'm sure you didn't go on your own with this thing. So, of course, in the beginning, I'm, as I said before, I was, I'm a vision for Chuzit and I went to the vision for Rebbe Zechariah of Rocha of Monsi, I was his Chuzit. And when it all started and I realized that I'm going wrong, it didn't take me long to realize that I'm going wrong. And, I, and I, someone uh, mentioned to me about a man, a guy, very famous today, Avi Fischoff. And I was considering maybe going to him. And at the beginning, I was fighting the idea myself. And I was saying, this is crazy. This is stupid. This is the worst thing I can do to my house, to let my kid do whatever she wants. It's going to ruin my house. It's all speculation. Now that I'm thinking back, it's all theory, speculation. There's nothing really to establish it. But this is how people think. They, because it goes back to a person when he feels that he loses control. So he automatically, if I'm, going to lose, if I'm not going to be in control, it automatically means that the whole house is going to go to be, could be ruined. It, and it's not. And you don't think you have this many, and you go, I'm going back to, to a, a physical sickness. In physical sickness, you can see you cannot control the situation. You do what doctors tell you, what professionals tell you, but you can't control the situation. And you hope for the best. And you hope for the best. Daven, you hope Daven. for the best. And same thing goes here. In each I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure a lot of tears when oh, I we was were crying. rolling in the middle of family. No, in the beginning it was, I couldn't face anyone. I couldn't look anyone in the eye. I was crying through nights. It was not an easy me, my wife, we lost a lot short. This was nights of sleep and weeks of we didn't eat. We didn't How long is this saga taking place really? So it started I would say twelve years ago. Wow. Yeah. And Bor Hashem, we are where we are. So in the beginning when I was introduced to such a kind of a mahalakha, instead of pushing away yeah, I'm starting to say about the Rebbe. Right, and, and, and instead of that uh, some guy, Avi Fischoff, instead of pushing away, you embrace. learn, you embrace, and you learn what your child is going through. He's trying to explain it to you. So you live with what your child is going through, the struggles of your child, and you struggle with your child together. So you really can embrace and you can really be in their bubble and in their world. You can relate to them much better and build your relationship and build them up from the ground up. And when I was introduced to that Mahalach, I really thought that this is crazy, and I couldn't round my head around. I couldn't wrap yeah. my head my head around with such a crazy uh, idea. Advice. You know? So, but when I started realizing that, <laughs> that what I'm doing is wrong. What's option B? Oh, yeah. What's or really, plan what's B? option A? I know. I, I would say it's like this. No, it's Plan B. I always, I have it always uh, in my signature in email. I always write. Under my signature, I always write my slogan, 
life is all about how you handle plan B. Because this is what it is. Uh-huh. And yes. I, can, I always Very say, well said. yeah, people that go to Avi Fischoff, no one comes their first choice. Everybody tries first to control the situation. So nobody should think that people that go to him are the people that have normal situations and they choose rather than controlling their situation. To just so, it's so organized, it's so planned. And yeah, and they, no, it's the people that tried, people that failed. And when they realize that they're really going bad, from bad to worse, and they want to open their eyes and face their dilemma and deal with it, that's when they realize there's no other way. So I went to the Rebbe and I told him about it, that my daughter is struggling and he was crying together with me. I went with a quittle, it wasn't pleasant. The Rebbe was literally crying with me and he was like frantic what's what's going on. And then I told him that I learned recently there's a new ask on the block. His name is Avi Fischoff. What was the Rebbe's opinion generally about such kids in the beginning, I guess? The, I, I can't say that he had a general opinion because I hear so many stories. Versions. Yeah, envisions itself, how one person is told this way and one person another way. And, I, and a lot of it, I guess, has That's to do with yeah. the way a question was asked. Because we know people go to a Rebbe for business questions and Many times we hear stories of people that got the answer that they were looking for. So for people that the situation of dealing with such a kid is tough on them and they think that by throwing out the kid they will get rid of the problem, right? They will release them from the problem. They will go to the Rebbe and ask it in such a way that the Rebbe should say, throw him out of the house. So when, when a person looks at a situation like something that is going to ruin his whole house, it's going to ruin the whole family, because this is what he anticipates. And he goes to the Rebbe and tells him, uh, yeah, and he goes to the Rebbe and he tells him, oh, listen, Rebbe, I have a kid that is mama's ruining my whole house. It's what's going on in the house, cursing and whatnot. And of course, the Rebbe would say, you know, if it's ruining your whole house, the Rebbe might say, uh, get rid of the kid. It's ruining your house. You can't let other kids fall because of this kid. So that's in my humble opinion, but I wasn't there when other people asked. I can say that I was there once when I asked about one uh, another of my child, my children, and I uh, I was had a child that was also like a little bit struggling, but not as bad as not as hard as this one, but also struggling, and I couldn't take it, and it was hard on me. And I said to the Rebbe, I'm thinking of sending this child away, and the Rebbe said, What? He was angry at me. What are you talking about? And I said, I can't handle him. And this was after, after before the story of oh, my before. daughter. Before, before, and I told the rabbi, and I said, uh, but the rabbi told this and this person to send away his child. The rabbi told me, you want to compare your child to that? What are you doing? So it, it wasn't a, and, and I so then I realized, you know, it might be also that other parent asked the question different. I don't know. I wasn't there, but. When I had a, a, a conversation... Please tell me this, this child is doing okay today. <clears throat> the time the child, Baruch Hashem, has Simcha Sachaim, is living with a purpose, with a vision on the future, wow, and Baruch talking Hashem. about a future. I'll get to it in, hopefully uh, soon. But uh, the way it looked in the beginning, there was no talk of a future. No, wow, it really? could not ever be brought up, something oh. about a future that you never wanted to hear about get, ever getting married ever building a house, ever discussing having children. And now it's all about that, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, so, Hashem guitar. A person that believes that she has a future and can build a house has a lot of confidence. So I can say that we build up our kid from ground up. And Baruch Hashem, she's today, Hashem. she has a sense of humor, either it's genetic or it, goes, or it goes viral. Uh, yeah, not stamp. And she lost weight. She, she is off drugs for the past, it's almost two and a half years already. She went once to rehab. And I can say one thing that I can share. There is not, if you realize that you cannot control anything, nothing you can control. Some people I know that pushed their ch- children to go to rehab or to go to... So even uh, this... Even this, Even this you be. didn't push, you didn't promote never, it. Never, never. So how did it happen? She, she asked for it at a certain yeah. point? Wow. So when I, when you, you can build I think up this your is child. The, I, think, I think this is the bombshell of this podcast, of this interview. If, if the viewers of Let's Talk Tachlas 
heard now something that a child that struggled so much and went through such pain, such ups and downs, such lonely nights, such, so much friction in the family, came to a point of saying she wants to be helped with, with, uh, with the drugs. I think this is the biggest chiddush, the biggest encouragement for suffering for, for, for families and people and parents and stuff. Oh, wow. So in the beginning... I think you can go home ready. <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning, it was all about uh, whiskey and vodka. She used to get drink, drunk. This was normal. And, and later, she revealed that this is what she used to fall asleep, and she used to get drunk. Beer, everything alcohol. She used to like drink like no tomorrow. And she later got it off by herself when we... You know, we started building up and she got rid of that on her own. But unfortunately, it changed to drugs. It started with uh, weed and it went on to much, much harder stuff. And Burkha Hashem, she got out of it. Wow, wow, wow. This and is... now, uh, it's already uh, probably a year or so that she also quit smoking. Wow. On her own. This was totally on her own. And when she decided now, she's so strong. But when she decided to quit smoking, she never once yet took a cigarette. Please tell it, I'm very proud of her. <laughs> we all are. And so are all the viewers from our, from our podcast, all very proud of her. And I'm sure she's going to... Now to be proud of her is nothing. I was I... proud of her every day throughout oh, these 12 wow, years. It wasn't is... one day when I was not proud of her. And I really, I really felt it. She wow. never embarrassed me. Wow, wow, wow. As soon as I realized that... Uh, I'm going in the wrong direction. I can say in the beginning I was embarrassed, it was embarrassment, it was everything. But as soon as I realized and where I live and what I have to do to turn around, and I realized it's, that she's broken, I wasn't embarrassed anymore. Wow, amazing. What a, what a, what a difference. You know, when I had a funny part at so the beginning, it was me identifying with her. Meaning, so. There was a Muncie uh, grand opening when Evergreen started the supermarket and they, it was a grand opening. whole town came in, yeah? And I decided that day she wasn't dressed the way we are used to and I would go with her shopping, meaning hand in hand and push the cart together with her and shop in the store while everyone looks. And what I would do? Just look them back in their face. I didn't even stare down to the floor. I just stared back. Wow, it takes so much... And it built her up. It gave her so much strength wow. that I can wow. identify with her in public. I used to hold her hands and go out from my house to my father's house on a Shoshuna at night to go say the Shoshuna Toive. She would only stick Baruch Hashem. She always stayed home. She wouldn't wander around anymore when I want to be turned around. <clears throat> and I would go hand in hand. Now the Shoshuna in Vizhnitz was the umptive that we had thousands and thousands of people came from all over the world. The Rebbe. And it was in front of everyone. I had no embarrassment, no nothing. And I went with, this was my pride. And I'm sure your wife is 100% locked in in the same. My wife had the same situation and came to weddings, let's say, right? And she was at the woman's side. And my wife just held on to her hands wow. and sat next to her identified I with I think her. almost the word spite came back in now. <laughs> <laughs> Despite all these people, I'm going to show you that I'm strong and I'm, wow, this is unbelievable. And you would think that people, the, the instinct is that you believe, that you think that everybody will look down at me that I have such a child. And it's the opposite. When people see how you stand next and you stand One with your child, they only admire you. One. I only got compliments. Never. I was maybe told something, I don't even remember. It, it, it went in one ear, it came in the other. So the only uh, hard situation was, so I went to the Vision Rebbe and I told him about this Mahalach of Avi Fishov and I asked the Rebbe if I should go to him and the Rebbe said, of course. And I asked him for a bruche and he gave me a bruche. So I went to him. Later, uh, some neighbors, they were all scared about the situation, what it's going to do to the neighborhood. And people are also scared of the reflection. Beyond really so worried for their kids, how the neighborhood is going to appear. So this is the neighborhood where... And I can tell you one thing, that if people would realize that if you can respect a child, a broken child, they're not desperate to bring in their own friends 
to get courage or to get physical. Okay they're okay with the, family, okay with the fa family and they're okay with neighbors. Right. If neighbors can get along with those kids, there's no reason to shame them, no reasons to embarrass them. We're used right. to yell at them. It doesn't, bring, doesn't do anything. It only makes them that they are looking out for support. And who are they bringing for support? People from outside. And it's only going to make the situation worse. I'll tell you a very scary story, but uh, even if it's not uh, where we're talking now, but it's, it's something to make people aware. I, I just heard of this Matzah Shabbos, and I know the people involved, I know the families, I know all the people. I know it firsthand. And so the person that repeated to me the story told me the story that I knew. It was a kid that went south and neighbors didn't like it. And they asked the father to move away. And he didn't want, of course. Why would I move? So one neighbor uh, started arranging that the neighborhood should come and protest. So every night there were no, protests. No, 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 I can't handle it. In front of that house. Can't handle it. Of neighbors coming. And one, one neighbor was the, the head the of leader. It, the leader. And they were yelling, move away. Shy gets, whatever, I don't know what exactly they'll be yelling. Years went by, that uh, family fell apart at the end. No wonder. And they moved away, and, but, I'm talking years went by, I'm talking maybe over 20 years, good over 20 years, and the person that, the leader of that group, he himself has now a few kids off the derech. Okay, I, I, and it was only recently, when he realized that maybe I did something wrong. He picked up the phone, took some courage, and he picked up the phone, and he called up that person, his prior neighbor from years ago. And located him. And started, yeah, and started begging him for Mechila. And he said, you know, would you forgive me? I realized that I went wrong. I was, it wasn't uh, the proper thing to do. I want to ask you for Mechila. And he said, I re I'll, I'll be honest with you, I have a few kids now struggling, not, he, uh, mm -hmm. not from. And I realized it might be because of this. The man told him, I want you to know that you ruined my whole family. And I want you to know, I want to know how many kids you have that are struggling. And he said, Some. You. He, gave, he gave him the number. He said, don't call me yet for Mechila, because I daven to Hashem. When this happened, that you should have more than this. Oh, off. Yeah, 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 yeah. And since you're not there yet, I'm not going to be more for you. This is so painful. This is too much for me. It's scary. Uh, it just goes to show no one is uh, Hefker. No Hefker, and no, and no one knows. Hashem Rachem, Hashem Rachem. I just heard this much of Shabbos. But the one, I, I'm sorry, this, let's talk Tachlis, is a happy place. I have to go back to Boch Hashem to your successes. You killed me now, by the way. You killed me. But I want to go back to your successes, and I want to, I want you to tell our people, our viewers and listeners, that as much as we dove, as much as we beg the Eibush to, it shouldn't give us these challenges and this but Chaz Shalom, when it happens, give me a few words of courage for the people, how strong they should be and how positive they should be and they should not let it drag them down. Please give us give us encouragement. I'm I'm gone. So I can tell you that all you can do is If you don't want me to walk out on a on a wheelchair from this place, <laughs> you better build me back. You you, you do you have an excellent record of, of rebuilding people. You have to stay focused on what you're trying to accomplish and what's your main goal here. And remember that and don't think about anything else. Don't get turned away, turned off, and don't get distracted by what neighbors will say, or parents, or grandparents, or anyone. And it only uh, brings calmness back in the family, only builds up your family, and it builds up your kid. And the main... Because we can say it with... Sure. With the, what, I was focused, what I was focused is on a few things. Number one, I was very strongly focused that my kid should not own anything to anyone else outside of me. Meaning, she shouldn't have any hakuras atoiv and be desperate enough to ask someone on the street to provide anything to her 
and owe that person anything. So I wanted to make sure whatever my child needs is coming from me. And the only person she has a kudus atoiv to should be me. What this prevented... Mommy and me. Yes. And what this prevented... And I'll tell you where I started. And this is by letting my ego go. When I first wrote a letter to her, an apology letter, you wouldn't believe what that apology entailed and what it included. And I just realized when I, so once I realized that she was in pain and she was broken, I had to tell her that I feel sorry for not realizing and for not... Apology for that period her. between when you discovered yes. and till you started changing your style. That's, yes. that's what it focused on, right? Yes. So I took the blame. I, I'm sure you, I, know, I know you. I'm sure you were a great father, generally speaking. You and your wife were great parents all throughout. You didn't become totally... Now you became smarter, and, but, but I'm sure you never did anything wrong to this kid before but things started when you, happening. So when, the signs of things going bad is when you think that, when you see that logic doesn't work. Every kid, you, you don't think, I realize right away, yeah, I'm telling my child, you have to wake up on time. You think the child doesn't know that? I'm not telling them any news. I'm telling them anything that is about structure, yeah? The child knows exactly, okay? They grew up exactly like the other kids. They grew up together. They grew up in a healthy, fine, normal home. And, and, and as soon as you realize that this is out of logic and doesn't make sense, you realize that with logic and with sense, you will not get anywhere. Because the logic they have, sense they have, when they don't make sense and they lose logic, you... Pushing logic into them doesn't change the situation. It just makes it worse. You just tell them. Just tell them. What do you mean? You can't tell them? Then you bring in spite. You bring in fights. You make them lonely. You make them be alone. And they try to pull other people. And they need some support. They'll get it. And if they can't get it in the family and everybody's get strong against them, they'll get outside. And if anything they need, they have ways to get it. They'll get it. Unbelievable. I think we can be here all night. <laughs> But I'm so happy that we are, we can conclude this amazing conversation in a positive note. How, I, I, I couldn't bear to interview a parent that is in the first phases. I'll tell you what was my, sometimes you have, that in order to jump up, you saw that sometimes you have to bend down a little bit so you can get a better jump. So by me, the, my daughter, get life. You can see a lot of those kids, they need love to an uncontrolled uh, and an unimaginable amount of love, on the imaginable level. So many of them, they need dogs to survive because a, lo a dog is not judgmental and it gives you love to no end. And this is what they need. But my daughter has a different thing that gives a mom's life. And this is babies. The smile that a baby gives her and the love that a baby gives is also, a baby doesn't judge, a baby loves you, smiles back to you, and she gets life from that. So she used to work by a babysitter. Uh, but all of her money, all was gone, she did not, a, not a penny was there, plus how much I paid and helped and supported her all these years throughout the journey. And in many, many ways. One day, a, from father came in to the, pick up his baby by that babysitter and he saw that how she's dressed and he told that babysitter he cannot let his baby a few months old <laughs> he cannot let his baby be with such a girl over here so she has to tell my daughter to dress up so what do you think she dressed up right of course she dressed down <laughs> so my daughter came home and said my job is gone that's it so i told her me and my wife sat down with her and we said, you know what, going forward, let her go and you will start your own babysitting in our house. Unbelievable. And she said, I'm a shiksa. That's what she said. I'm a food and a shiksa. Who's going to trust me with their kid? No one is going to give me a child to watch. I'm, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. I said, okay, don't worry. But it's, not, it's, it's still worth trying. It's not worth giving up. And I can tell you what's today, <laughs> that as soon as people find out that they're going to have a baby, they register with oh, her. My. She takes a very responsibility, so she's very responsible. She only takes, she has a helper now, 
and she only takes up to, I think, 12 or 13 babies. But this is her life. And this gave her life. My whole house throughout the week is turned upside down with cribs, play pens, and whatever these Pampers, kids need. bottles, zombies. Everything and oh. crying in the house, babies crying, oh, babies happy, is... and she's talking and walking, and it's all about the kids wow. and everything. Can I register my grandchildren by yeah. her? <laughs> and, and, and this I'll is... drive them from Brooklyn to Marcy every day with pleasure. And, and it all came to a halt, a short stop at COVID. Oh. This was one of the saddest times, the hardest times throughout this whole period, watching her unravel. She lost her whole appetite in life. So for weeks, Never. she was in bed. She didn't Never. bother coming out. She had no purpose in life, not coming out. And it was horrible, that situation. And I felt to myself, you know, I saw, I, I lived in Vizhnitz, as I said before. And when this whole thing came about, and neighbors started threatening me that they're going to make protests and stuff. And I said, you know what, I'm moving away. I sold my house. My house was paid off, my mortgage. I was, um, I lived with a tenant that paid me rent and paid off my taxes and my insurance. I lived basically only paying utilities. I lived free already. I sold my house, I bought a new house, now I'm paying mortgage again without any tenant. I built a beautiful room for my daughter over there and I made it as, as comfortable as only imaginable for her. I made it, mom, a beautiful, beautiful section that I built special for her. And this is where she stayed, Baruch Hashem, throughout all these years since and I moved. And COVID, she, she restarted. And then, after all this moving and after all this Boom. sacrifice, to have uh, this thing go down, collapse. collapse, I felt like, where is this going to go now? And that's when Hashem, uh, that's when she realized that it's, going to a bad situation and unless she takes it in the situation into her own hands nothing will happen she called me down one day to come to talk to her and i was sure that she's going to tell me that she's ending her life she's giving up she's giving up I, I didn't expect anything else and when i came down and she told me that she is looking for help and she wants to get out of this Wow, 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 what so a getting From getting her to... The be, fact that she herself... <clears throat> it's a second, a second bombshell you're throwing at me. I told you only, I, can, I cannot handle that much. She herself called out for help instead of giving up is unbelievable. You get a lot of credit and you're giving a lot of people physic now. If the baby thing is back on, are we back on? Right after COVID, it came back. Wow. It goes full swing, <laughs> and it's mamash, mamash. Every day wow. you should see how she talks to kids wow. and how they talk so, back to her. They call so me Zaidi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you own Aini Klechosa. Grandchildren come in. But Hashem is a matzah always going on. Wow, what a remarkable story. So it became the whole house became a calm house and a comfortable house where everybody's welcome and. And even when she brings, when she had to bring friends, they are welcome. Rather than her, her any, she never has to wander off to anywhere because wow. I rather have her inviting comfort her zone. friends over She's to my house. She's always in a comfort zone. Sure, and wow. whenever she wants friends, she can invite them over. It's not a wow. problem. Wow. Wow. We have beautiful shabusim. She never misses wow. a Shabbos dish, wow. never wow. misses a sida, wow. wow. and anything. I want to finish with one nice story. Yes. So the... Um, and she went to rehab, and she knew she's going away for before Yom Kippur. She went, she left Erev Yom Kippur, and she's going to come back on Sukkot. It was ten days. So she told me uh, on the Shoshuna, she says, "Tati, you know that on Sukkot I won't be home." And we used to sing every Sukkot. We sing Atu Vachatuni. The vision's a song, very nice Atu Vachatuni, and she loved it. She has, even now, every Shabbos, she is the one who's been getting, getting the kibbutz every Shabbos Friday night of singing Manich of Asimchul. That's her song, yeah. She gets, Eti Manich of Asimchul. And she starts a nice song and we sing. And so we used to sing together, Atom Khartouni, and she told me that as a young child, she used to come and sit on my lap when we were singing Atom Khartouni, and she misses those times, and now she's going to go to rehab. She won't be able to sing Atom Khartouni. Yeah. Wow. And that's so soon we don't sing Atom Khartouni. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, it's not a, a Shashuna song, it's for Sikhs. 
So she says, since I'm going to be missing you singing Atuba Katuni and Sikhs, can we sing it now? This is Shuna night. And I said, of course, come, sit on my lap. And she asked, she wants to sit on my lap the way she did it when she was a young child. And she came, she sat on my lap, and together we sang Atuba Katuni. Wow, wow, wow. This is what she needed before she went off wow. to rehab. There's no doubt that she's a very, very high, high neshama, a special neshama. And I'm sure that I have a lot of anachas from her. Yeah. And I know, I know that you have a lot of anachas from her. I do. I can tell you that uh, nowadays she loves to identify with me. So if it, we happen to be at the same time, let's say, in a supermarket, I would be going through an aisle and I, and I wouldn't even necessarily know that she's in the supermarket. And she, she would suddenly see me from the other end of the, of the aisle. She would like run. question that, not run. Yell from there, everybody should see that she's my daughter and talk to me in Yiddish. Wow. Tati, the mind's time of days, Salih Koy from days for Shabbos. Wow. She's amazing. And she wants to identify with, she feels so good wow. identifying with me. Well, I tell her again, and on behalf of all the Let's Talk Tachlis viewers, that she's very special. She is. And we are very proud of her. And I really want to thank you for coming here. I know it wasn't probably easy to, to go public, but I know the. The Tachlis, because it's called Let's Talk Tachlis, the Tachlis, the results will be amazing and I really, really appreciate you coming here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. My pleasure.